So now we move on to our last pairing of the morning. And that concerns shared versus personal rights in things. And we move to Maura Johnson, who is associate curator at what I still think of as the Society for the Preservation of Human Antiquities, uh, which she is rolling her eyes at me, but you know, I'm a old-fashioned adopted of New England, uh, now called Historic New England, Laura. <laughs> Thank you for, for saying Historic New England. <laughs> Don't adjust your sets, even though it says New England, I'm going to talk about Florida today. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Ivan and Sarah, for inviting me to be a part of this fantastic conversation. It's, it's an honor and, and a privilege to be here. So what I submitted for you today is part of a larger project that I've been working on for several years about cloth and its role in creating, or sometimes breaking, relationships between Native Americans in the southeastern portion of what we today would call the United States, and Europeans who arrived there. And I think you and I can have some very good conversations about sumptuary law and, and the value of textiles and how that changes over time. So we need to talk at lunch. <laughs> so this piece is my attempt to sort of test out some of the applications of linguistic and cognitive theory and in my study of the rituals of encounter. So I'm presenting a series of early contact situations in the mini entradas that the Spanish and later the French made to this region. These meetings were often recorded and they uh, describe the ritualistic use of space and objects to interact, often when language wasn't a possibility. So they relied on commonalities, the body, feeding it, clothing it, <laughs> touching it. In many cases, touch was a very important part of this, of this ritual. So what developed was almost a code, although I, I use that word very hesitantly, um, of uh, involving clothing and exchange. And I wanted to put the object at the center of this, because what I'm really looking at, to speak of cultural biographies, is a cultural biography of clothing in this instance, following um, uh, some, some of what uh, Laurie Togion has done with brass kettles to come to what Peter Stolle Brass has so beautifully called the worn world of early Florida. So, cloth and clothing are really at the center of the, all of these early contact negotiations from Cortez and Montezuma all the way to DeSoto and Ribo and the many natives that they met with. So what you're looking at here is Cortez not only meeting with a Mexica individual, but look at the items laid out to accept this tribute here. Um, I think the pointer is not functioning. But uh, right in the center front of the lower section there, it uh, laid out on cloth and then a series of other articles. Thank you. Um, this is a piece of folded cloth right here. This one's also misbehaving, but oh well. <laughs> so mo looking at cloth and its role as a primary communicator in, this, in these interactions. De Soto's chroniclers in particular noted that these interactions were part of the rituals of peace, which I think is an important phrase to keep in mind because we so often thank you, <laughs> think about um, these uh, interactions as being violent, which they often were, but they specifically talked about these first interactions as being rituals of peace, using mantas de la tierra, or mantles of the land, blankets of the land, right? So, Right at the, from the very first in the 1520s, you're starting to see these descriptions all the way through the 16th century. So I want to back up a little bit and talk about history and historiography and theory, uh, because these are so important, and this is what I'm really testing out on all of you today. Because I'm trying to play with two big theoretical concepts here. The first is metaphor, and I was so glad to hear metaphor mentioned uh, by Henry yesterday, and he and I had a very good conversation about it yesterday evening. Because I, I regard metaphor here as more than a symbol or an illusion. It's a reflection and an agent of deep structure in society. It's understanding the world in terms of what we already know, right? That's what a metaphor does. We look at one thing and we understand it in terms of another. So some of the scholars that I'm drawing on for, uh, for this are Lake and Johnson's work on metaphors, obviously, <laughs> but also Stephen Greenblatt's work on possession and kidnapping. And I think Prown's notion of metaphor is important to mention here, but I'm using it in a very different way. So that's one big theoretical construct. <laughs> the other is translation theory. 
And I'm specifically looking at translation as a concept here as how it was used historically. So how it was used in the 16th and 17th centuries. Specifically in relationship to clothing, because to translate clothing in the 16th century for a tailor was to deconstruct it and then render it in a different way for value, uh, to keep its value, but move it in a different manner. That was to translate it. The other way that translation specifically was used was when one joined a livery company. So if one was translated into a livery company, one was clothed to join it. They specifically used those terms. So when we look at the lens of material culture and the history of contact, and we, we, we sort of use those terms to, to, to look at that, things become intermediaries. So exchange, barter, gift, theft, all become precursors to spoken language interaction. Objects develop and inform vocabulary. So if language is informing object understanding, and, un and understanding objects informs linguistic development. Now, Greenblatt regards this as a developmental trajectory, right? It's right straight up from the front. You go right from words and, uh, uh, um, all the way up. But I think it's a lot more complicated than that. So understanding how goods were used, presented, and perceived helps us understand how groups did not, that didn't speak one another's language, because in many of these instances, they didn't have interpreters. Um, they didn't have any way of interacting. So when you can't talk to one another, what are you reduced to? You're reduced to signs and vehicles and exchange. So in order to argue that both natives and Europeans could use cloth as a medium of interaction, I thought it was really necessary to back off a little bit and look at how cloth functioned in both those major groups prior to contact. So what you, the first part of what you saw for today was looking at um, how natives used textiles, how they thought about textiles prehistorically. So I'm relying on partially the archaeological record but also the artistic record and getting at the nature of what do we do with objects when all we've got is text is <laughs> a big part of what I'm thinking about too and sort of thinking about rather than um, objects as text that we think of objects through text in many ways. So for prehistoric Native Americans, um, you've got pieces like this fantastic twined textile from the Etowah Mounds uh, here on the top left, um, which is actually filled in little bits with rabbit fur uh, in, the, in the interstices. So it's lace. It's essentially twined lace. And these formed large dance kilts. These were owned and used by the elite members of these societies, mound building societies throughout uh, the central part of the United States and down to the southeast. And uh, so what you're looking at here is uh, on the lower left are some of the versions of the circle uh, dance kilts in, in practice. So Mississippian garments like the ones from Etowah were worn by these high, incredibly members of the hierarchical society. Um, but just as velvets and silk and damask were thought of and used, not just as, but similar to uh, how they were being used in uh, 15th and 16th century Spain and um, throughout Europe. So textiles in particular, I think, become an effective method of cultural interaction in these early rituals encounter because they're both thinking about them in similar ways. So for Europe, I'm looking at sumptuary law, but the important thing to remember about sumptuary law is it was usually created because it was being broken, <laughs> right? Um, so many people are, are talking about, you can't wear this, you can't wear this, because people want to transcend those boundaries. They want to move beyond them. They want to take clothes and create that perception of status and prestige. Um, and so, so the other way to get at this, I thought, was not just to look at sumptuary law, because that's obviously restricting your, your data set pretty significantly and, how, and, and who you're looking at. So the other way that I thought I could get at some of this was to look at daily sayings. Um, because a lot of these can be traced back. They seem to have a very strong folk history throughout the 15th into the 16th centuries. So for the Spanish in particular, things like, como te veo te juzgo, or as how I see you, I judge you. Um, or, um, por la facha y por el traje se conoce el pernosaje. So uh, by sight and clothes, you know the person. And that's just a rough translation. I'm sure others could give a better translation than I am. So that gives you a sort of different way to think about how dress and clothing um, was being perceived and used. It blurred social boundaries, social, racial, and class boundaries. So uh, it, in New World societies as well, the casta paintings that codified dress and status 
could also inspire deep desires. Over and over again in these paintings, you see dress and textiles connected with perceptions of race and status in society. So uh, at least one scholar has argued that these, these paintings were supposed to codify this, but it also sometimes had the exact subversive opposite, right? That seeing these allowed, made people desire them even more to, to transgress those boundaries. And Sophie White on the right in working in um, the French colonies in Illinois and Louisiana has found that dress actually can alter one's perception of race, not just status and class, but race, uh, especially early on. So looking at how dress moved into the Southeast in these rituals, rituals of encounter formed the second half of my paper, and I give you a series of case studies uh, to do that from Native efforts to draw on their own backgrounds to create spaces where gift exchanges of these mantles of the land could occur. And you're looking here at the Lady of Kofida Cheke. Uh, she was described as entering um, into these encounters uh, with the Soto and others, <coughs> carried on a palanquin, dressed with white mulberry curtains. This is Debris' interpretation of that, that where he, was, he wasn't there, he was working from Lemoyne's sketches. Lemoyne describes it very specifically as mulberry silk. That kind of got lost in translation. <laughs> and so what you see here is more of a moss uh, covering, um, because they often describe moss as being worn as some of these garments. So I think there's, there's some wiggle room there in how we're thinking about images and, and, and using that to work backwards into, into text and object. But these, this is another uh, series of that, and I particularly love this close-up from the map uh, done by Debray to show this first setting of the um, connecting of the French and natives in Florida, because in the lower corner there, you see that they are creating a separate space set aside with branches, and then platforms, and then they would often put deer skins or mulberry cloth or other types of things to, to create a separate space where you could then meet, exchange, and interact. So where do these things survive? How do these things survive? How do I get at notions of cloth and clothing in an archaeological context? It's a little challenging. Um, there are a few things like the galoon that you see here that was recovered from the tunica mounds, as well as cloth bale seals that help track taxation and import uh, duties uh, that were recovered from Spanish contexts. But what I'm really getting at here, why did I spend so much time talking about metaphor and translation? Because they're playing out in these physical encounters. So that the objects that are being exchanged in these elaborate settings are physical metaphors for contact and interaction. And I just want to give you briefly one example of that. When Hernández Soto met Samumo, who was the cacique of a regional group called Otamaja, De Soto offered him a silver set feather. Samumo was so excited that he said he would wear it. He would eat with it. He would even make love to his wife in it. This was only the first thread in that story, because De Soto's gift to Zumumo's superior named Okute, whom De Soto claimed to regard as his brother as part of this exchange, included not only a silver feather, but also a yellow satin cap and a shirt. And over and over again, you see these encounters where men are often taking objects off of their own bodies in order to hand them to gentlemanly men that they thought should be dressed appropriately. So you, you've got entangled notions of dress, tribute, power, and kinship all in one garment. So that's some of what I'll be exploring. But what I'd love to hear from you is, let's talk about metaphor and let's talk about theory as well as how is it's being used in, in, and how I'm thinking about using it in this instance. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. And so now we uh, come to Neil Curtis. And Neil is head of museums at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Neil. Right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to show three case studies drawn from you know, various bits of work I'm doing. And so I'd really like to thank Ivan and Sarah for inviting me and for everybody in the room for giving me a chance to try to show there's some coherence between the different things I've been doing. So it, it, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, so. First, this is the overall thing. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it's lovely. Um, so, one thing is this: this group of um, leaf-shaped swords. 
Um, one of which, the one on the left, um, is in the Aberdeen collection, as are, I think, the two next to it. But I found other ones, one in the British Museum, one in Aberdeen City Museums, um, one in the Na National Museum in Edinburgh, and one in the National Museum in Denmark. And so I was researching these, I had suspicions about them, they were far too similar, um, they were far too good. And so I, I followed both sort of textual approaches, so looking at the archives that are associated with them all to get some idea of the stories, um, how they'd appeared subsequently in various publications, including various archaeological you know, corpses of um, Bronze Age metalwork. Um, also the labels and the writing on them, so all those different forms of text. And then the other strand was thinking much more about the, the material aspects of them. Um, so we did some XRF analysis of them um, and we could identify different metal groups uh, and such like. Um, but also looking at the, the wear patterns on them and the, the way they've been altered. I mean, you see one of them's got a, a wooden handle, which certainly isn't Bronze Age. Um, <laughs> now the interesting thing, of course, was that the, the, the XRF analysis wasn't conclusive. That didn't show what was going on. It was only this combination of different sources and, of course, this hint that's been lurking around with some of them. Um, and in essence, what I discovered was that one of them is late Bronze Age and the rest were all made in about 1810. Um, <laughs> And it's the stories and the changing meanings of those that I found particularly interesting. So that one of them, you, you can't see it on, on this slide, but it, it has written on it, and it's a you know, it's beautiful um, cursive script, a, a, a nib pen, Roman and Agricola. And, so, and there's also re records of their um, finding which associate, say, found between two Roman camps. In other words, not in a Roman camp, but between the two, <laughs> so they must be Roman. So... I do feel sorry for the, the antiquarians in the northeast of Scotland who were desperately keen on the classical world and couldn't find anything. So, <laughs> did. so that's, that's one thing. Then there was a visit by the Danish antiquarian Jens Vershoe in 1846, I think, to Scotland. And he saw these and he, he was actually given one of them, one that ended up in Denmark, was given to him by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. When he got to Denmark, he unpackaged it and saw it and said, it's a fake. I've seen some of these already, so he'd already been there, um, and the society actually promised to send the next real one they got. Well, <laughs> they still haven't. Um, and he was interested because he, this is the 1840s, the Danish-Prussian War, and he was trying to show how great Denmark had been in the past, and so was showing Danish expansion in prehistory. So they became basically Danish objects to him instead of being classical objects. And then subsequently, of course, they've appeared, um, and indeed some of these have appeared as authentic Bronze Age metalwork. In some of the corpuses you read about um, Scottish Bronze Age metalwork, these appear. The other bit is, a, as a museum point, the, um, the way that that sense of authenticity sort of comes and goes with some of them. You can see the same object sometimes, like the one that I've shown the, the, the close-up of, has always been seen as dubious. Other ones haven't, and it's come and gone. Now, one of them, you see the third on the left, had a wooden handle added to it, which meant that that was therefore used with school classes as a copy to give you the feel of holding the object. So in some ways it had a greater authenticity than the one that's broken, that is Bronze Age. So the question is, it also was one that was lent for display in other museums. It obviously mattered less to the museum. So there's strange things going on about the, the meanings and how they, they, they fluctuate. The second case study I want to pick up on is the Scottish Exhibition in 1911 in Glasgow, which follows very much the, the Great Exhibition World's Fair model. Um, but unusually, this one had a focus on Scottish history. Usually they're about you know, imperial progress and trade and so on. This had a, an unusual focus. It wasn't the first one. There was one in Edinburgh a few years before. Um, it also was unusual because the, the aim of it was to raise money to endow a chair in Scottish history and literature. And it succeeded massively in that, and that is the, the chair in Glasgow, that's, that's its origin. Um, and it had a very clear narrative structure, and we talked about this yesterday, and it's something I think is quite important with this. Um, and, yeah, also picking up the, the, we're meant to be thinking about shared versus personal rights and things, um, it was a loan exhibition, it was drawn from lots of collections around Scotland for this moment. So unlike most museums which have a legacy, they've got stuff they have to display. Here the organisers were able to choose what they wanted. And you can see here, actually what they were doing was they were trying, some of these, they clearly wanted to borrow anything from him. 
He was more important than the object quite often. But you notice the, the bias towards the individual ones. Now, I've tracked a number of these objects, and if you did this, assemble the same objects today, they'd almost all be institutional. There'd be very few now in private hands. So there's been a quite a change over, over time with that. And then, finally, the issue of politics about, uh, about it, that um, there was a sense of an agreed narrative. It was that set by Sir Walter Scott. He wrote Scottish history. Um, and so, indeed, in the exhibition, it ended with Scott. There was nothing on display basically later than the 1830s. Scottish history ended at that point. This was Scott's thesis, that the, the present and the future is Britain, the past is romantic Scotland. Um, and the, some people who have written about the exhibition before have picked up the idea that um, it was patriotic, it was nationalist, it was, there, was a, there was actually a bill going through the, the UK Parliament at the time to establish the Scottish Parliament in, in 1911. Um, and it's been seen in those terms, but what I've found from the people who actually ar arranged it were all conservative and unionist, and they were trying to state how Scotland had its place in, in the empire as equal with England. So it's quite striking. There were sections for different relationships with different countries. There was one in France, there was one in the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway. There wasn't one about England, because that's too important, and there wasn't one about Ireland, because we don't talk about the Catholic Irish. So there, was, there were selections and patterns going on. Now this is actually something that's going to hit me as a problem with the deadline you set on the 15th of September, being one day after the referendum. <laughs> so, in terms of agreed narratives of national identity, I'm stuck. So, so finally, that, you know, very briefly, my third case study is about repatriation. I don't want to talk in any detail about repatriation just now. Um, but I'm interested because unusually those things I've shown you before are objects coming into a museum. This is showing objects escaping, which museums tend not to think of happening. In fact, the more you look at museum collections, you discover how many objects have actually vanished over the years. But we pretend that's, that's not happening. Um, and I want to think about the, the material impact of repatriation. That there's the absence. Now, the, uh, the case I was involved in, the one on the right, we had an exhibition about this object once it wasn't there. It was the most powerful use we ever made of the object was its absence. Um, the one on the left in Glasgow, they got a replica. And that, again, they make a lot of. We didn't get a replica because that would have been insensitive. We discussed that and said, no, you couldn't have a replica of a, a, of a sacred bundle. Um, however, the, the man who was the keeper of that, he, um, in, in the, the, the Kainai in um, southern uh, Alberta, um, he ordered a Bunny Prince Charlie kilt jacket, which he wore when he danced the, the headdress at the sun dance. So there, there's clearly it's a material aspect around the, the aura of it that is material, not just uh, about uh, meaning. Um, and clearly the whole process of discussing repatriation has been a challenge to museums and thinking about um, the, the decision-making process you go through. You know, who's got the right to make decisions? So there's, that's something I, I've, I've discussed. And the types of museums. There are some museums that enjoy repatriating things, and there are some museums that hate it. So that in terms of a you know, classification of museums, this actually might be another way of, of looking at them. So finally, some of the issues that um, I've been thinking about, and certainly you know, so far over these last couple of days, I've been you know, further playing with them and getting it. You know, I, think, I think we're getting somewhere. Um, whether I am, I don't know. Um, firstly, I'm really interested. We're talking about affordance, enchantment, and so on. The idea of numinous, ob numin numinous objects and it's really fascinating. Some of these things, they just do something more. Um, and some of these are objects that they're crossing category boundaries, and so they're very revealing of categories. That wonderful idea of miscellaneous object that tells you so much more than the ones that neatly fit within the, the categories. Um, and related to that is thinking about some of these things as, you know, as relics, and the, you know, the role of a relic and the complexity of that and therefore, you know, the place of museums as sacred places. There's just an, an awful lot, you know, to, to unpack in that. Plenty of other people have done it as well. Secondly, um, I'm going to use a you know, word we're not to use, understanding the nature of the modern museum. <laughs> and I don't really care what we mean by modern. It's not got a capital M in my notes. It's got a wee M. Um, <laughs> but partly there, I'm, I'm emphasizing again, the museum as a sacred place. 
I think that's a very important thing. We've, we've treated museums far too often as, as rational, and they're deeply irrational. Uh, and I'm constantly aware of this. The collection that I'm responsible for is so problematic. I mean, I think that the pain and suffering and complexity that's there, and we try to write numbers neatly and everything, and pretend they all have the same space, uh, sort of semantic space. Um, and as I said, the politics, decision making. Now, just I was playing yesterday with words. Um, and the way in which the modern museum is so closely tied to the idea of Wissenschaft, it's a, you know, it's a much better word than science, it's great. Um, now, as you can tell, I don't speak German, but nonetheless, there is a lovely little thing. I, I want to in invent a German word for the sake of it, which would be Wissenschaft, with an E, <coughs> which is about whose. So, you know, we're thinking about, and so I think that maybe that's where we are now, is sort of, you know, Wissenschaft Museum. So, it's a game. I'm almost there. Um, but finally, the, the bit I hope I've, I've shown through there is I'm trying to emphasise and focus on the physical aspects of the biography of objects. There's been so much interesting work in the biography of objects, and yet so often it's actually about archives. It's about text, and it doesn't get into the object. Um, so that's why I'm fascinated by um, you know, the, the uses of things that they, they've subsequently gone through, the way in which the wear and changes and writing on them is actually part of that and is the strength of that story. So it's not just about some sort of external value. And you know, this is always this tension we've got with objects and so on. Is the value and the meaning in our mind or is it in the object? And I think that's the bit we've really got the challenge to try and pull both of those things together. So. Thank you, and I'll carry on thinking until September the 15th. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So we have time for some discussion, and I see Elias' hand is up. Um, I have a comment for Laura. Uh, one of uh, the characters of a book by Garcia Marquez mm -hmm. is standing in the beach looking at three caravels that are coming. Mm -hmm. um, so he says, uh, let's get out our clothes so that they can see us, I quote, as our mother delivers us. <laughs> so what I want to tell you with this is those depictions that you showed to us just show one part of yes. the of the story, so it would be uh, good just to mention mm -hmm. the how the Indians registered their part of the exchange and um, the relationship with clothes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and in, in the larger project, I absolutely try to get at that. But it, it's a good reminder that yes, yeah. there there are two sides to the story. And putting st the the stuff at the center, I think, allows me to to look at both sides equally. <coughs> but clearly, it's yeah. a good reminder. Thank you. Uh, David and then Monica. Uh, Neil, I enjoyed your uh, presentation very much. I'd love to hear you talk more as a museum uh, person about uh, this category. You used the term numinous, uh, an old word that has had a lot of use in religious studies. Uh, the sacred, uh, uh, it, it's, I mean, a lot of people don't like the idea of the sacred as something ontological. I mean, scholars, they like it as something that's consecrated. It's an act of producing it through ritual practice or whatever. Um, but but as, a, as someone who watches people do irrational things before things, uh, what, what, how, how would you define the, the numinous? Is it a, uh, just a I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, there, I mean, there's been so much work. I mean, like, you know, going back to Carol Duncan and so on about, you know, you know, art galleries and museums as sacred places. So, I mean, there's absolutely nothing new. Um, and clearly, you know, watching people in a museum, the way they behave, it's, it's, it's odd. Um, the other way I came at this was thinking about human remains and the, the place of them in museums and how we handle them. And I was getting increasingly concerned that we were trying to have a category that was human remains as distinct from material culture. Mm -hmm. And that meant that we could therefore, as, you know, as museum curators, we could treat human remains differently. So they were vulnerable to repatriation. That was safe. It didn't actually threaten the rest of the collection. Um, and it also meant that, you know, you thought, who is making that decision? It's the museum bureaucracy that decides. So, you know, it's the Western power is again saying, right, yes, you know, you're complaining about what we've done. We'll let you have that bit. And we'll continue to have, you know, the rest of the stuff that actually matters to us. And partly that's about, I think, the, the chain, changing attitudes towards human remains in Western culture, that there's, 
you know, we're, we're now investing different meanings in them. We're much less comfortable about going into a museum and see. I mean, I, I, I had a, a one amazing um, description, maybe goes back to the point you're making, that somebody came into me and told me how our museum is closely associated with anatomy and anthropology. And she said she used to come in to see her dead twin who was preserved. Oh and I thought, it's, what's this context? What's this place that has that sort of meaning? Um, so it's not something that is an abstract, it's just people being quiet and not whistling and so on in a museum. There's actually some of the, the, the material, the way they're expecting it to be, to be treated that, to my mind, in a very crude way, makes me feel it's, it, 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 it's about sacred material. The other one is, I, I mentioned glibly, re relics. Um, I just am increasingly coming to realise, you know, these, you know, the objects I'm classifying as, as numinous are so powerful. And I was in Istanbul a couple of weeks ago and seeing a fragment of the Prophet's beard mm. and fascinated there in the way which that was being seen in a way unlike it would have been seen in a Catholic church. And also, in actually, the way a museum would see it. So it was, it was very interesting. Sorry, that's Mr. Mm -hmm. I have quite a list here, uh, but I will get to all of you who, are, who are, uh, have raised your hands. Monica. Um, Laura, <laughs> I really appreciate your papers. Uh, so true. The, the closer you know, at the core of those uh, encounters. Um, uh, one question I have is uh, the issue of uh, the connection between translation mm -hmm. and exchange. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, uh, at the same time that we can talk about things signifying something, we can talk also about uh, ruptures in communication mm -hmm. and actual misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with, with the case of uh, encounter with Cortez and when mm -hmm. the indigenous people give him clothes mm -hmm. and, and he completely misunderstands yes. the meaning of the yes. ritual. So, um, I mean, that, that's uh, one point. The other point is uh, because, as um, Olaya mentioned, this is kind of seen from one side of the story, the European side of you know, how they interpreted those uh, encounters. Um, how are those uh, uh, perceptions being kind of already um, shaped by the circulation of Indian objects mm -hmm. that was happening since very early on. Right. I mean, uh, uh, Alexa Alexandra Russo recently has a, a study in Cortez's objects uh, mm -hmm. yes. and this kind of you know flooding of uh, Indian objects for diplomatic reasons. Mm -hmm. So those objects have been already kind of assimilated into the European culture mm -hmm. of uh, exchange and, and, and gift giving. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, to the first point about translation and exchange and misunderstanding, misunderstanding is absolutely critical here. Um, and in the bigger project, I, I try to um, work with that more, that quite often what would happen is the, the uh, Native peoples would approach, they would make all of these wonderful gestures using clothing, um, offers of the <coughs> these mantas. But the Spanish, even though they had sort of the, the mental... Um, machinery to understand sort of how this was supposed to be perceived because of those preconceptions in many cases that had already been circulating about how these exchanges were supposed to work, what was supposed to happen, what was supposed to be going on, didn't recognize that they were being approached in this manner. So they already had preconceptions about how it was supposed to work. And so communication broke down and misunderstandings did happen. So um, it wasn't until like after 1550 and into the 1600 even, where you start to see a reconsideration of, uh, on the Spanish side about, oh, this is what they're trying to do <laughs> um, that isn't always successful. Um, so I, I think in both those cases, yes, absolutely, how perception and uh, circulation of these goods was occurring at, after, almost as soon as it was happening um, is directly related in many cases to misunderstanding. but getting at the, the native perceptions of that is always the trickiest part for me because it's always filtered through um, European per, uh, descriptions and perceptions. And, you know, archaeology is my attempt to sort of try to get at the other side of that, but it's, it's obviously limited, very limited. So that's my struggle. Yeah, but thank you. Now, we are scheduled to conclude this session at noon, but I think there's such interest and we also 
lost a little bit of time in the way that these things happen. So if, with your indulgence, we'll go on a little bit longer. Uh, and then we have a, we have a, a buffer for, for lunch. Uh, so I have on my list Peter, then Marla, and Colleen. So for Neil, uh, the question of the irrationality uh, of the museum, first off. And I, I couldn't help but think about the conversation at the end yesterday with Anne and Lambros about niche construction, mm -hmm. and whether, in fact, we could think about the history of collecting as a form of niche construction. That's to say, there is, um, there is action in time, right, which is normative without necessarily there being an end, right? So history without an end, and that could explain what's happening there. The other is the, uh, the call out about the importance of looking at the things as opposed to the text made me think of uh, Dan's comment earlier, the allusion to the long running debate with Ivan about textual versus tangible things, and I'm wondering if that could be exploded out for the benefit of the rest of us. I don't see anything more now. Yeah. Laura, is there anything you'd like to say on that? Or? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's an absolutely valid mm -hmm. point. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. This is, this is taking us in a good direction, Mom. I wanted to um, respond to this idea that objects want to escape um, from museums and objects are escaping. And, and, you know, what the, some of us have huge collections, and you just wonder if they're all crying at night when you close them, of course. But I wanted to, to bring up a, an interesting experience that we had with a collection of Maori uh, feathered cloaks that came into the collection uh, with a gift from Sir Henry Welcome, um, with the objects that escaped from England and ended up in California, which was truly an escape. Um, but we, we wanted to show them, but we never wanted to show them without offering the first experience of them, one that was mediated by the Maori themselves, the Maori today, who continue to feel that these objects have potency and meaning. And when we, in, when we put them out on tables and we had our first group of Maori advisors come, including a, a weaver, what they did when they saw the objects is they broke into song, that these were living ancestors, that the traces of the ancestors imbued in the objects remained a living presence. And only, of course, they could see it and they could feel it because the objects belonged to them. And that encounter was possible, but they didn't want the objects back. So in other words, I, I think we have to be careful that there isn't only this idea that people always want their things back, that sometimes there's a great deal of joy in the way that we can share these objects with others and provide this experience. So, you know, I think this, this idea that an object is numinous is often in the, the aura that's only present for the people who once owned them or for whom there's a direct connection. Can I just tell two wee stories about the repatriations I've been involved in? One of them was um, time up to um, Te Papa. Um, so these are human remains, so there was a um, the pressure on me was you will repatriate the, you know, the, the political pressure within the UK was such that you know, I, I was trying to construct some sort of rational narrative I was defensible within my terms I knew the real quality to the whole thing um, what was interesting though is they, they came with um, both a Polynesian argument and a bureaucratic argument they, 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 they came brandishing a letter from the Prime Minister so it was quite interesting that, and my questions actually were about their right to represent the um, who were um, apparently wanting them to be returned. It's where I found the, the, the bundle more interesting, because that was people who were asking for themselves to put it back into use, um, and saying about you know op objects and um, whether they want to go back or anything. Um, firstly, we showed um, them when they, the Kainai group, when they came, all the North American material we had. And we said, is there anything else that, not that you want to take, but is there anything else that interests you? 
And it was actually one of the things to me that clarified um, why it was so important that we did return that particular bundle because they saw, oh yes, there's a shirt. That would probably dance with the headdress. Mm. It's a shirt. Right. Mm. And that's why actually the kilt jacket's quite a nice little link to there. And that to me showed why, why this mattered. And so it was my way of understanding the difference between that as a sacred item as distinct from something else. It wasn't my terms, it was their terms. Also, the um, subsequently, you know, the, when I, they invited me to the sun dance to see it dance, um, and they said to me, yes, you know, the, the headdress, it decided it wanted to come back. Mm -hmm. And I then be thinking, where's agency in this? I've gone through African policy documents, gone through all this paperwork, and apparently the headdress just decided it wanted to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so how do I handle that? And that's something I still struggle through because I have to operate pretending that I do have agency. <laughs> and yet, I'm also accepting, and this is the same you know, with, with any ethnographic work, you have to accept value systems that are not yours. You're respecting them, you can accept. Maybe that is what's going on, maybe it's not, I don't know. And so I found those two different cases very, very different, and very illuminating in different ways of what we were trying to do, and maybe not trying. It's the problem with policies, is they don't deal with particularities. <coughs> Uh, I mean, this is my, my concern, where, we, where there was an attempt to write a document on human remains in Scottish museums, and I was very concerned that we start having a sort of statement, you repatriate them, you have particular thresholds that people have to meet in order to repatriate, instead of talking and thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Time for just two more questions. Uh, first, uh, Colleen, and then Judy. So I'd like to kind of continue this conversation about, about um, your museum. And this notion of authenticity, I was really struck by the swords. And at one point you said something like, well, they really, the one that they, was the fake, they really liked a lot. And in some ways it was, it seemed to be more important. It had, somebody said earlier, more potency and meaning. Mm -hmm. And so I'd kind of like you to reflect a little bit about the, the Scottish people who come to visit your museum and whether or not they have a sense of authenticity, that that means something. And if it doesn't mean the way it did at different periods of time, is that, can, it, does that say something about the importance of the dematerialized media that we seem to be moving towards in museum? So away from the actual physical object that we no longer sort of see <coughs> an authenticity in the object itself, but, but media can make an immaterial image more meaningful in some ways. And so I'm just kind of wondering about sort of contemporary museum goers in Scotland and, and this question of authenticity and meaning. I mean, one other thing I'll say is I really care about these swords. To me, they are intensely meaningful and numinous. Mm -hmm. I am sure that most people, it's a sword, they really don't care. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one that I highlighted, the wooden handle, the reason I was flagging that one up is because it wasn't on display uh, in the, the conventional museum. It was one that was used with school classes. And so um, the other objects they were handling were authentic Bronze Age material. This one wasn't, and they were able to handle it not as the, you know, the, the very careful, but mm -hmm. we let them... Never mind health and safety. Right, right, um, right. But they were they felt it as a weapon. Mm -hmm. And and, and that's so more meaningful and in some ways more authentic, it would yes, seem. And that's I mean it was a it was a more authentic swordy weapon mm -hmm. but a less authentic mm -hmm. prehistoric antiquity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it just depended so much on the context within which we set it. And part of that context was the, the was the way it had been uh, the the handle had been completed. Both in 1810, it was extended to make it complete, and then in probably about 1970, it had the wooden handle added. Judy. Um, yes, uh, again, uh, th thank you very much, um, Cora and, and Neil, for your excellent papers. Um, I wanted to, you know, I'm hoping to respond to um, your, your very interesting rumination on your relationship to uh, objects that seem to wish to leave uh, and or end up leaving um, and first the, this issue of agency and 
in, in a way to perhaps help you uh, think it through that this notion of agency may not have any relevance, um, at least within the cultural practices. I believe you were dealing with the, 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 the black foot, but that's something that you might mm -hmm. want to, to ask them. Although it certainly has become an issue in terms of their historical experience and their relationship to museums and and folks of your ilk, yes, to use a very isn't that a story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and so that as a, as a, as a means by which uh, curators within museums, very well-meaning people. Um, um, who also happen to relate to these rather problematic uh, artifacts or relics of the past, um, it might be helpful to think about um, distinguishing or, or historicizing use, the notion of use itself. Uh, there's the culturally, contextually bound notion of use that's generated by a given party, then there's the, the notion of use that um, developed uh, through the curator slash museum. So to you know parse it through um, as as a way of you know thinking about you know, whether this headdress did in fact wish to 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 leave. Um, you might consider that there's something entirely internal uh, that's taking place within the given community that requires. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, when I'm talking about the, the story I, I tell about the headdress, you know, it is my story. It's also one that at the Sundance I was, t I was told to, you know, go on to tell your story. You're at a Sundance, yeah. which is a particular kind yes. of ritualized yeah. experience. Now, I'm, therefore, the, the Blackfoot side of that, st that story is, is not my story, I'm not going there. Um, there are things that um, I learned going through the process which are not mine. And you know, so that's where, I, and so I'm, I use the word agency solely from that museum standpoint, right. that I can use it in that way, and I'm very much sticking on that side of it. Um, I mean, there are there are completely different things. Somebody else could tell if they if they want to in a different way. It just it's not it's not mine. I don't and I don't feel I don't actually feel terribly constrained by not having that because I think the story I'm interested in is about what museums are and how we're operating with things. And so you're seeing things coming in and going out, and you're getting little glimpses of something else. Doesn't mean you need to understand those. You just need to glimpse them and know that there's something else. And it does you know relativise a bit what we're trying to do.